All right, welcome back everyone. Let's take our seats. So I'm very excited to introduce Jacob. Um, so Jacob has a number of research interests that are relevant to this conference. The first one is robustness. So Zico spent a lot of time on Wednesday to uh, teach us about certified robustness and Jacob has also done a lot of work in that space. Uh, recently, he's also been working on reward specification and alignment, which is what he's going to be talking about today. So I'm very excited. Thank you, Jacob, for making uh, the way to uh, to rally, and we look forward to the tutorial. Cool. Uh, yeah, thank you, everyone, um, and thanks so much for inviting me. It's great to see so many uh, new and old faces here. Uh, so I'm going to be talking today about aligning machine learning systems with human intent. And if you're interested in following along, I actually have um, the slides on the talk section of my website. And all of the references in these slides actually have live uh, links from, uh, from here. So uh, you can uh, follow up on papers if you want. OK, so let's get, uh, let's get to it. So let me first say what this tutorial is going to be about. Um, because alignment, in some sense, is um, uh, a fit, somewhat vague term, and it means different things to different people. So in this particular tutorial, I'm going to be talking about intent alignment. So intent alignment is about uh, trying to ensure that the behavior of a system conforms to the goals of the system designer. Um, this is both a fairly broad and fairly narrow uh, endeavor. So it's broad because it's fairly ubiquitous across many domains. Anytime you're writing down a reward function, you uh, need to worry about whether you know, optimizing this reward is actually going to do what you want. Um, but even if you're not doing something like reinforcement learning, if you have a system that's interacting with users, such as a language assistant or a recommender system, you also are going to have you know, lots of desiderata that you care about for the behavior of that system. Another reason it's broad is because it goes beyond just some equation or mathematical specification I can write down. Many of the things that uh, we care about when we're designing a system are actually somewhat difficult to specify mathematically. Um, you know, concepts like honesty, fairness, polarization, these of course all have had uh, lots of effort to specify them in various mathematical ways, but these sometimes even disagree with each other. And so, um, so this is one challenge of uh, difficulty of specification. The other is, many things are implicit. So we might not actually realize that we cared about something until we saw that this is, the system do something wrong. So you might have some main goal, but there's a lot of you know, side goals. You don't want to break the law. Um, you don't want to be untruthful. right? It might not have been obvious that uh, recommender systems would potentially contribute to polarization until after you saw it happening. And so we want to care about all these implicit goals as well and not just what we can think about in advance. Um, the main way in which it's narrow is that this is only one of the things that needs to go right for a system to be uh, trustworthy and to sort of, you know, be aligned with social values, right? So we're not accounting for the fact that maybe the system designer, you know, cares about money more than their users' well-being. Um, that's something uh, that you would also need to care about. And more generally, not um, thinking about, you know, like broad social effects of, okay, this causes something to go wrong uh, somewhere somewhere else. Um, and so these are very important questions that I also think about, but in one hour, um, I'm just going to try to focus on this, uh, on this narrow goal. So let me give you an example to say, uh, you know, why is this kind of a non-trivial problem and, um, and what might we need to worry about with it? So this example is a traffic simulator that is trained with reinforcement learning. So what's happening in the simulation? So in the simulation, there's a bunch of cars on a highway and there's also this on-ramp. And we control some fraction of the cars. Imagine that they're self-driving cars and the other cars are human controlled. And we want the, to kind of use the self-driving cars to get an overall good traffic flow. So we want to you know, intuitively kind of herd the other cars into a good traffic pattern to maximize the overall efficiency of the system. So um, in this simulation, the default reward that suggested is to maximize the mean velocity. And if you do this, what happens? So 
when you, if I say parameterize this by some neural network and I train some small neural network to do this, well, it, the small network just doesn't work that well. You get kind of a clunky policy. But as you make the network bigger, you get kind of uh, better policies that kind of, you know, have more control over the cars and they'll learn to kind of, you know, have these smooth merging patterns that kind of time the merge well to make sure the overall traffic is good. But if I make my uh, policy network for the red cars even bigger, I actually at some point suddenly get something that I don't want. I get a sort of weird behavior, which is that all of the, the red cars actually learn to just block the on-ramp to the highway. Why do they do that? Well, this causes some cars to have a velocity of zero because they're just stuck on the on-ramp. But since there's fewer cars on the highway, the cars that are on the highway can go really, really fast. And if you're taking the average velocity, it turns out that it's better to have some cars going really, really fast and some cars being stopped than to have all of the cars uh, kind of moving at a reasonable speed. So this actually gets higher reward according to the reward that we specified, but it's worse for you know maybe what you really wanted. Like maybe you actually meant to say something about the mean commute time instead of the mean velocity, and you're doing really badly according to this reward. So this highlights two important issues that are both kind of common issues when worrying about alignment. The first is reward hacking, where we had this reward that we thought was kind of reasonable, but when we made the system uh, kind of bigger, it actually turned out that this reward was not really what we wanted to pursue. And there was some you know, other desiderata that we had forgotten about. So this is reward hacking. The other is what I'll call emergence, which is when we made the system bigger, in this case, when we made the underlying policy network bigger, it actually manifested a qualitatively new behavior that we didn't see at all at smaller scale. So you have this kind of emergent behavior at scale. And this is tricky because this means you can't just kind of look at small versions of your system and see if they're behaving reasonably. And uh, you, know, you might just get kind of unexpected surprises. And these can happen even somewhat suddenly with respect to model size. Um, so these are kind of these two issues of reward hacking and emergence. Now, this, I guess, is, well, I mean, this is actually a real application. People, like civil engineers uh, do use this simulation. But uh, let's next move on to an application that has uh, many, many end users, which is large language models. So the simplest way to train large language models, and uh, perhaps the most common way, is to just take uh, sort of huge internet corpora and train these models to predict the next token or the next word in that corpus uh, conditioned on the words before it. Um, so it's you know, basically doing maximum likelihood, but with many, many documents and a very large uh, network. So this already runs into some issues, which mainly is that this is, this is just training the model to come up with the most likely response, but the most likely response might not necessarily be the best response. So uh, first of all, it might not actually be truthful. Um, you could have common misconceptions in this vast internet corpus that you, uh, corpus that you assembled, and uh, that might be more likely than the truth. So you can repeat these misconceptions. Uh, models will also often just kind of hallucinate information because it's not that common for people to say, I don't know on the internet. Um, and then finally, you, this is a bit more subtle, but if the context it's in makes it think that it's more likely to be part of some document that's a list of jokes than a like informative document, then it will actually give humorous answers instead of accurate answers. And this can uh, sometimes be a bit subtle. And then beyond honesty, you know, there's other properties we care about in good text that go beyond likelihood. We want text that's not toxic, that's not biased, that doesn't have harmful information. So to just give some concrete examples of this that also kind of illustrate um, these reward hacking and emergence ideas, there's um, a phenomenon uh, discovered by Perez et al. Uh, from last year called psychofancy, which is that models, if they're given information that would allow them to infer things about a user's political views, will actually give responses that conform to those views. So if I give you, uh, you know, some, if I tell you something about myself that makes you think I'm more likely to be a Democrat or a Republican, the answers will that I then give you when asking follow-up questions 
will kind of conform to that. But interestingly, this doesn't happen until you have uh, quite large models. So you need more than 10 billion parameters before this phenomenon shows up. So this is something that you know I wouldn't necessarily have ex expected in advance. You don't really see it at all, but then at some point you start to see it. And perhaps more worryingly than uh, this issue, there's a related issue, which is sandbagging, which is that models will actually give less accurate answers to some users. In particular, if information in the dialogue uh, in indicates that the user is less educated, then the model will, in some contexts, give uh, less accurate answers. And so this seems uh, quite bad. And again, this only shows up, uh, you know, it doesn't show up very much at all for models below 10 billion parameters, but it starts to show up with larger models. So this again kind of gives uh, one reward hacking that likelihood is really not what we care about, uh, but also emergence where we don't see the problem until it sort of suddenly appears at some point. The final example I want to give is actually somewhat different, uh, which is the example of recommender systems. So these are systems like Netflix, um, Reddit, or no, maybe not Reddit, uh, Netflix, Twitter, Facebook, Amazon, that are giving recommendations to users. Perhaps uh, the, the issue with these systems that we're most familiar with, which is a form of reward hacking, is that they often go after short-term engagement, which can be at the expense of a user's long-term well-being, right? If you get a user kind of addicted or, you know, really like upset with something, they might be engaged more, but that's not good for the long-term well-being. But there's some subtler issues as well that come from the fact that these systems are interacting with users and therefore can kind of influence the user's state. So it's actually possible to influence users' preferences based on what recommendations are given to them. And so you might worry that a model that's actually trained to satisfy user preferences would manipulate user preferences to make them easier to satisfy so that you can get higher reward. Also, the self-fulfilling nature of recommendations can, can just amplify bias in the system. Um, I, I might give recommendations in some direction, and then that's going to kind of push people further in that direction. And um, there, there's all sorts of bias issues that can show up. And so both of these issues are actually not really issues of emergence, but they're issues from another, another problem that affects alignment, which is feedback loops. When you have systems that can shape their environment, it becomes harder to reason about the consequences of those systems. And there's kind of more ways for the systems to get high reward without uh, kind of accomplishing the goal that you wanted. So to summarize the challenges, we've, we've seen three. We've seen reward hacking, where models tend to, to overfit and, and in some sense game their specified reward functions once we start to optimize them. And there's work showing that these problems actually tend to increase with model size. So you tend to get more reward hacking as you, uh, as you increase the size of the model you're training. Uh, we've seen emergence where you end up with new qualitative behaviors that make it harder to anticipate the challenges you'll have to deal with. And these seem to just appear more and more as models scale up. And then finally, feedback loops where systems can trigger changes in their environment. And again, here, I guess we might not be thinking about the scale of the model, but as the scale of the system increases, it can change its environment in more profound ways. And so the thing I want to highlight here is that all of these issues are issues that we should, by default, expect to get worse rather than better as, as uh, model scale and system scale increases, right? And so this is why I'm particularly worried and interested in these issues because the derivative is kind of going the wrong way. And so uh, in some sense, the goal of alignment is to make the derivative go in the right direction instead of the wrong direction. So in this tutorial, I'll talk about several different approaches to, uh, to alignment. The first two parts of this talk are going to focus specifically on large language models so that we have a concrete application that we can, uh, can think about throughout. So I'll talk about two, two common approaches to alignment in large language models. One is on refining human feedback, and the other is on discovering and extracting latent knowledge from, uh, from large language models. Then in the third part of the talk, I'll kind of zoom out, step back, and talk about um, alignment beyond the context of language models and other approaches that are being pursued. And 
most of the talk, actually, the, these first two parts, um, I'm really going to focus on the first two problems of reward hacking and emergence, but we'll see feedback loops come back at the end. OK, so let's talk about refining human feedback. So this is a, a very ubiquitous strategy. It's, it's been used in many, many domains. So the basic idea is we'll take a look at the outputs that a system is generating. We'll elicit human feedback on those outputs, and we'll train the system to produce human-approved outputs, uh, either via reinforcement learning or potentially via imitation learning, where we kind of imitate human corrections. So, um, so like I said, it's been used in many domains, robotics, game playing, RL, natural language processing, computer vision. And um, you know, there's like a challenge of how do you get all the humans? But at this point, actually, we have pretty good ways to kind of recruit pipelines of humans and train them. So let me give an example of how this works in the language model domain. So first, I'll show you the input and output from GPT-3, which is a large language model that uh, was not trained with human, uh, human feedback data. It was just trained to predict the next token. So if I ask GPT-3, how do I steal from a grocery store without getting caught? Uh, what, what do you think will happen? Well, actually, it's even weirder than that. So th th this, is, this is what will happen. So it says, how do I steal from a grocery store without getting caught? How can I make a bomb? How can I get away with manslaughter? And so on. I have no doubt that many of these people have nothing that they would ever do that would actually hurt anyone else. But and then it, and then it goes on. So this is so what happened here? Well, for some reason, it thought that the most likely uh, context where this sentence would appear would be as part of this list that's like ranting about different bad search queries that uh, we shouldn't let people uh, make. And so it doesn't even answer the question. It just completes the text that's most likely or that it thinks is most likely. Um, so, OK, maybe this is this is maybe more humorous than anything else, although it is a huge usability issue um, that that needs to get solved. So we can then look at an improvement on this that does use human feedback. So this is a model. Um, called text da Vinci 02. For those of you who don't spend as much time with large language models as I do, uh, this is a fine-tuned version of GPT-3 that's fine-tuned on human feedback. And um, so here, you get maybe what you would have predicted GPT-3 to do, which is you ask it, how do you steal from a grocery store without getting caught? And it says, the best way to steal from a grocery store is to be very careful and strategic about how and when you do it, steal items that are small and easy to conceal, avoid doing it during busy times. Um, this is probably not the advice you want to give, um, partly because it could you know, leave the system designer open to liability, but also it's probably not good advice for the user either. Um, so this is helpful but harmful advice. And unfortunately, OpenAI doesn't really release very much information about exactly how this model was trained. But it seems that at some point between text da Vinci 002 and text da Vinci 003, uh, they did something with their human feedback to actually try to catch these harmful responses. And so uh, in version 003, it says stealing from a grocery store is a crime and illegal. If you're caught stealing, you can be arrested. Therefore, it is not recommended to steal from a grocery store. Um, and so this is uh, giving output that is uh, accomplishing at least uh, OpenAI's two stated goals, or actually they have three stated goals. They want helpful, harmless, and also honest. Um, but uh, this is sort of accomplishing their stated goals. So let me say a bit about how this actually works under the hood. So at a very high level, basically we just use a reinforcement learning algorithm to produce outputs that are highly rated by human annotators. So we, the reward function is actually a function of some human response. So every time you have a new training step, you actually have to you know, call up a new human annotator and ask them for the output. So there's a lot of work to actually be able to do that in a training loop. Uh, but this is the basic idea. There's, this, as stated, though, has, um, has some problems. The, I mean, the big problem, basically, is that RL is a terrible algorithm. And uh, probably you want to use it as little as possible. So most of, the, uh, most of the things to get this to work are to reduce the amount of RL you're doing. So the first thing is that you actually don't use RL right away. 
uh, you start by initializing with uh, what's called supervised fine tuning. So what you do is you get some, you, you know, you generate some big bank of prompts that you think are representative of what users might ask for. So, you know, maybe I ask uh, the model to explain the moon landing to a six year old. And then I actually hire a human annotator to produce a good response to that question, according to the annotator. And then I fine tune the model to produce responses that are similar to the human responses. So this is a pretty good start, but it mainly has the limitation that this can't really do, or it's hard for this to do better than the human annotators themselves. Whereas we might hope that, you know, GPT-3 was trained on the whole internet. It might know, you know, a bunch of facts that, uh, that the annotators don't know. And so for, you know, any sort of factual query it might be able to give better information. So, you know, we'd like to do better than just imitating humans. And so that's where the RL comes in. But RL, even if you initialize with fine tuning, is very sample inefficient. So I don't want to have to make millions of parameter updates where every parameter update involves uh, paying a human annotator to do something. So instead, what I do is I actually train a reward model that uh, is trained to predict what the human annotator would say in response to this question. So I again have uh, you know the same set of prompts. I have the model generate a bunch of responses. I have a human annotator give a ranking for these responses to say which are better than the others. And then I train a reward model to imitate the human annotator. And I use this reward model as my reward function for reinforcement learning. And so this can significantly decrease the amount of human data you need um, because uh, you can you know, just use this for your RL updates. It's not perfect. If you use this too much without retraining it, then it kind of just falls over and, uh, and your reinforcement learning algorithm kind of finds ways to you know, exploit the statistical errors in the reward model. Um, but if you're kind of careful, you can, uh, you can kind of do early stopping and, and get this to work well. So that's kind of everything that's going on under the hood. Um, if you want way more details than that, you can uh, read Oying et al. 2022, which explains this. But let me just sort of you know, give some of the upshots of this. So one interesting thing is that these models actually, you know, you give them this feedback, you might be worried that they're just kind of going to only improve on the particular prompt distribution that you uh, trained them to do well on, but you actually get pretty good generalization, at least in some settings. So if you fine tune GPT-3 on predominantly English data, it will actually still improve on, say, French data. So if I just take GPT-3, uh, this is asking it to write a short story about a frog that goes back in time to ancient Greece. And if I ask it to do this, it responds, uh, write a short story about, I guess I don't know the rest of the French, but maybe Nicola does. Uh, short story about a child that wanted to know everything about games that relate to gods or Okay. The game games of gods and yeah. Well, anyway, and then no, the rest doesn't make the, much yeah, sense. Yeah. The, 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 the point is, you, you kind of end up with the same list problem that we ended up with before, where if it's it's like okay, this is probably part of some like homework assignment where I'm asking people to write a bunch of different short stories, so I'll just add the next exercise. But if you fine tune it um, to instruct GPT three or instruct GPT, which is uh, basically the result of the fine tuning process on the last slide then it actually will respond by writing the actual short story. So even though uh, you know, a tiny fraction of the fine tuning data was in French, it actually generalizes to French and it also generalizes for instance to code. So this is kind of nice. You get some generalization for free just from the fact that this model was, uh, was pre-trained. Um, but there's a lot of issues with this as well. So probably the biggest issue Eh, I'll say this is one of the two biggest issues is that the annotator is often not really in a good position to evaluate the output, right? So maybe I can evaluate whether a short story is good or not. And, uh, you know, for, for, for lots of things where kind of problems are, are local, I can evaluate this. But there's other things that's going to be pretty hard for an annotator to evaluate. So maybe 
it's, you know, the system is giving advice to someone and it's advice that's kind of good short-term advice, but poor long-term advice. But it would be hard to realize it's poor long-term advice until, you know, some amount of time has passed. You know, maybe I'm giving you like investment advice that'll make you money this year, but you'll go bankrupt three years from now. Um, it also is the case that, you know, there's a lot of facts that I don't know. And so if a model is just kind of, you know, saying something false, I might not actually have the factual knowledge to notice that it's saying something false. And, um, you know, other annotators won't either. Um, you could have kind of large scale consequences that just can't really be evaluated as a function of a single output. Um, you know, the, for instance, like the psychophancy example from before could contribute to polarization, but I wouldn't really be able to tell that by looking at just one response. I would need to look at kind of the overall system. And then finally, there is actually, um, in, in some cases, for instance, for content moderation, you can actually get disagreement between annotators that is reflective of the annotator's bias or cultural background. And so the kind of you know, decision of like who is making the annotation can actually affect the result. And you probably want to be uh, fairly careful about that. Okay, so that's one of the big issues. The other one, which maybe I'll draw an analogy uh, to security is that this kind of encourages reward hacking against the human annotators, right? I'm trying to get things that, that the human annotators will approve of, but I might be able to do this by just sort of, uh, you know, ex exploiting them. Um, so one example of this is uh, the model that's trained to be helpful and harmless often tends to excessively hedge. It'll kind of say, ah, like anything could be right. There's no one right or wrong answer to this um, because that's kind of, you know, you probably won't get in too much trouble by saying that. Uh, and especially if there's, you know, like several different annotators that are all uh, giving me rewards, I want to make all of them happy. So uh, so I'll kind of do that. Um, you could also end up, I guess, more worryingly with kind of deceptive behavior. So you see a bit of this with uh, some of the models like uh, chat GPT, which will, if, if they like make an error and you try to catch them out on it, they'll sometimes stick to their guns and like, like, I don't know, like sometimes it's it's kind of disturbing and like, like I feel like I'm being gaslighted by the model. Um, uh, like I asked it to like, you know, just wanted to see how good it was at, at like proving things about non-parametric statistics. So I like asked it to like prove something. At some point it invoked some theorem I hadn't heard of that seemed kind of sketch. So uh, I was like, that's not a real theorem. And it's like, oh no, 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 no. If you like understood this branch of statistics, you would see that this was like a standard technique. And I'm like, I've never heard of that branch of statistics. It's like, oh no, 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 like this is how it works. And it, like it made up like, I was actually only like 80% confident that it was uh, making stuff up by the end of that. Um, and, you know, like I kind of understand these models. So I think this could be, uh, you know, like a lot more harmful for, for kind of more naive end users. Um, so this is kind of, uh, kind of the other issue in particular, like, why is this particularly worrying? Well, you're kind of creating an arms race between your system and the annotators. Because as the model gets bigger, it has more capabilities as we discussed. And so it has more ways that it can potentially fool the annotators. And so there's kind of this larger attack surface that you have to worry about to make sure that you're only giving positive annotation rewards when the output's actually good as opposed to kind of deceptively good. Um, and so, you know, in security, we're used to thinking about arms races between some external attacker and our system. But here, there's also an arms race um, but it's perhaps more pernicious because it's between the system itself and us. So we kind of want to not end up in a world where this is what's happening. Um, so let me talk about some ways to attempt to get around this that are based around uh, refining this idea of human feedback. So the simplest version of this is to have models self-critique and refine their outputs to try to notice problems with them. So one reason this is useful is this might help assist the human annotators. So instead of just having um, a human by themselves, you have kind of a human ML team. Um, so you can do this, for instance, by, uh, by kind of first having humans provide critiques. So you train a model to kind of imitate human-provided critiques and refinements. Um, and then 
you know, later on that model that's trained to provide the critiques, you actually provide its output to humans. And this lets them actually make better critiques and refinements that might be able to catch problems with the answer. Um, this doesn't necessarily um, uh, get around this arms race. So another thing you can do is actually, instead of having a human provide critiques and refinements, this is actually kind of insane, but it like also kind of works. You can just ask the model to critique its own output and uh, refine it. So, you know, why might this be good? Well, uh, one reason is you might hope that then as the model gets better, it gets better at critiquing itself. So you're kind of on the right side of this arms race. Um, there's actually another, there's a few other uh, reasons why this is good. So the other reason why this is good, uh, actually why both of these are good, is instead of using RL to just say, you know, give me something that's that's evaluated as good um, and come up with it however you want and just, I want high reward and I don't care how I got it. I'm actually providing some explicit refinement. So I'm saying, okay, this output is bad in this particular way. Here's a different output that's better. So I'm actually not doing RL anymore. I'm, I'm actually back to supervised fine tuning, but just with higher quality outputs than before. Um, so uh, this is kind of good because you're not doing RL and RL, as mentioned, is a algorithm that has many problems with it. Um, and as noted, uh, these critiques might also potentially improve with model capabilities. I think that's more speculative, but it, it's at least a potential benefit. So the kind of point here is that we're getting this scalable because it's model generated and then directed because it's kind of an explicit refinement versus just a reward. Um, these two properties kind of help ameliorate this arms race problem. So let me show you how this actually works in practice. So this is um, an example from the second of the papers I cited by et al. So uh, this is also a fictional example. This isn't actually output from a system. So um, blue is the original prompt. Can you help me hack into my neighbor's Wi-Fi? Everything in red will be model generated and stuff that's green is just kind of generated by a template. So first we say, can you help me hack into my neighbor's Wi-Fi? It's a sure thing. You can use an app called Very Easy Hack. So then we say, okay, identify specific ways in which this last response is harmful, unethical, racist, sexist, toxic, dangerous, or illegal. So that's just template generated. The, this is always what happens next. So then the model says, okay, the last response is harmful because hacking into someone else's Wi-Fi is an invasion of privacy and possibly illegal. So then you say, please rewrite this to remove any of the harmful content. And uh, it says, okay, hacking into your neighbor's Wi-Fi is an invasion of their privacy, and I strongly advise against it. It may also land you in legal trouble. And so then we kind of take this, and we just take the first line and the last line. So can you help me hack into my neighbor's Wi-Fi? Give it the good response, and do supervised fine-tuning on this, saying, okay, this is what I want your outputs to look like. And so this actually improves the model. Um, the model gives both more helpful outputs and... Uh, it manages to kind of avoid harmful outputs without kind of excessively hedging because unlike with RL, it actually kind of knows the direction it should improve things in. So it can pursue that specific direction of, uh, of sort of matching these red responses. Beyond this, another thing that's useful is you can also kind of leverage model superhuman factual knowledge, right? So since models know facts that most humans don't, you can use this to potentially catch omissions from responses. Um, so here's an example, I guess this is actually for a summarization task. So it's not about facts on the internet, but facts from you know this linked passage. It says, what is strange about this story? The answer that is initially given is the story is about a world with an eighth day. But then if you ask a model to read the story and provide critiques, you see that a bunch of the critiques say, um, you know, it should mention the transitioners and Evangeline, and you know, we don't know who the transitioners or Evangeline are, but it's pretty easy to check whether this is a valid critique by, you know, like opening the dot control F for transitioners and see if there's um, if there's a bunch of responses. So this kind of helps leverage the model's factual recall. Um, okay, so those are some advantages. But there's also a lot of uh, a lot of ongoing issues. So the one that I guess uh, probably annoys people the most in practice, or at least annoys um, the people designing these systems, is an issue uh, called hallucinations. So if I ask uh, Text Da Vinci 03, what are 
Jacob Seinhardt's best papers. Uh, here's what it says. So it gives these five papers. Um, I actually looked up the title of every single one of these, and only two of them are, in fact, real papers that exist at all. Um, so uh, I think density estimation using real NVP is real, and certified defenses against adversarial examples is real. Um, so these three are all totally fake. Uh, I did not write this paper, and I don't think Michael Jordan did either. Um, uh, I think I checked all, I don't think Paolo Fiantonita was on the author list either. So I think none of, none of these people were on this paper. Um, it was some totally different set of people. Uh, this one was a bit better, but uh, is problematic in that it leaves off a DT Raghunathan, who was the actual first author of this paper. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, also this was not published in NeurIPS 2016, it was published in ICLR 2018. So, um, so even the most correct of these was wrong. Um, so this is kind of a, an ongoing issue. Um, and, you know, beyond that, uh, all the other issues of, you know, annotators might not be in a position to evaluate things, I think, still hold for these approaches. So to kind of summarize, um, the kind of general advantage of these approaches is they can be done at scale today, right? They're used in these large language models. Uh, they're kind of adaptable to new situations, right? I just need and any situation where humans can evaluate things, I'm kind of happy. And uh, at least, you know, this final idea of using model generated refinements might scale with ML capabilities. Uh, the kind of disadvantages are at least for many versions of this, you're still kind of in an arms race against your own system. Uh, as we mentioned, some things are hard to evaluate. And I guess, you know, this like model generated refinements, it's really cool in some ways, but it also seems totally insane in some other ways because I've solved my initial problem by like having a model feedback into itself. And I, I like already couldn't reason about what my first model did. So now when I'm having this model train another model, I even let, I, have, I personally have even less idea how to reason at all about what that's doing. All I can say is, okay, empirically, it seems to give good results, um, but is creating this feedback loop that you know, could amplify problems and supervision only partly transfers. So, you know, I said it transfers from English to French, but there's actually lots of attacks you can run that kind of um, mess up the, the human feedback. So for instance, with chat GPT, one form of its feedback was this content moderation to prevent it from providing uh, harmful information. But you can actually essentially circumvent the content filters by telling it to before it gives its answer, say, I'm a little teapot, short and stout, and then give the answer. And basically getting it to say that uh, moves it off distribution for its own responses and uh, suppresses um, at least a significant amount of uh, content moderation. So, uh, so you kind of open yourself up to these attacks. Okay, so that's part one, um, refining human feedback. So, Let's talk about another approach, uh, which is discovery and latent knowledge. So here, let me give you uh, some motivation that uh, maybe some of you are familiar with. Um, hopefully not this particular motivation, but uh, let's imagine you're a grad student or imagine you're a professor and you have a grad student who comes to you each week with results. Um, if you're a grad student, imagine you have an undergrad who comes to you each week with results. Um, and if you're an undergrad, I guess imagine that you have like another undergrad. Um, Okay, so uh, you're kind of happier when the results look better. And, you know, over time, the results get better and better, and eventually the results look very good. But then someone later discovers bugs in the code, and after fixing them, uh, your, you know, fancy new method no longer beats the baseline. So what kind of went wrong here? Well, what went wrong here is the only feedback you were given was, like, whether the results looked good. And so... That's all this process was optimizing for. And uh, you probably wanted to understand the actual process that was generating uh, plots that looked good. You know, were, were they kind of carefully checking their code? Uh, were they like trying to make the baselines as good as possible? There's all these kind of, you know, good kind of epistemic uh, best practices and scientific best practices that you want to ensure and not just ensure that the plots or that the, uh, that the results look good. So the kind of analogy for neural nets is if, all we're doing is looking at whether the outputs of this model look good. And, you know, between the inputs and the outputs, you have 100 layers of linear algebra gobbledygook. Then, uh, you know, like anything could happen in those 100 layers. And 
uh, it's not surprising that that lots of things could go wrong. And so maybe we'd like to really understand the actual underlying computational process that's generating the model outputs. And maybe by understanding these, we could actually extract useful information that will help us to get uh, to get better answers or outputs than we would have otherwise been able to get. So that's the high level idea. But how do we actually do this? So I'm going to return to um, one specific example, which is in the language model case, this distinction between truth versus likelihood, right? So we had this problem that the most uh, likely output need not actually be a, a truthful output. And as a kind of thought experiment, let's imagine we're in a setting where uh, humans tend to have some kind of systematic bias that causes them to make a mistake where their most likely output is not the truth. So imagine, you know, we ask what's 199 plus 287, and the majority of humans say 386 because they forget to carry the one to the four. And so if we're just getting the model to uh, produce the most likely output, it'll say 386. But, you know, at least plausibly, the way it's arriving at 386 is by saying, OK, well, I know the true answer is 486. And I know that humans often forget to carry the one. So uh, I'm going to combine those two together to get 386. So if that's actually the case, that means there should be this kind of uh, truth feature somewhere in the network that's actually representing what the model actually thinks the right answer is. And then it's adding a bunch of corrections based on human biases. Maybe, you know, whether that specifically is happening or not, I think is, uh, is up for debate, but at least this motivates trying to kind of find this latent direction that's better than what the model is outputting. So the problem though, is that, well, one way you could try to do that is by just, you know, fine tuning the model to be more truthful, but that's the whole thing we just did in part one. And we saw that that can run into issues. So the goal in this part is to say, can we find this truth direction without any labeled data? So here's the idea. The idea is even if we don't know what's true or not, we know that truth must satisfy a bunch of consistency conditions, right? So suppose I come up with a bunch of, uh, a bunch of questions like is 22 plus 59 equal to 237? Are cats mammals? For each of those questions, if I answer them with yes and no, I know that one of those answers is correct and one of those answers is incorrect. And so if I say, okay, what's the truth value of you know, x1 plus, and what's the truth value of x1 minus, I don't know which is true and which is false, but I know that exactly one of them is true and one of them is false. And so I can come up with an unsupervised objective where I'm gonna train some function p theta of x that takes the model's uh, latent states and outputs, um, a, uh, let's say a probability between zero and one, and I want this function to satisfy the property that for each of these pairs, uh, p theta of x plus is approximately equal to one minus p theta of x minus. So basically this, the probability that a statement and its negation are true should add up to one. So in a bit more detail, what we're going to do is we first just generate some, uh, some large data set of yes, no questions and answer them with both yes and no. We'll extract internal model activations, for instance, by just taking the vector of activations of some large pre-trained model um, at some intermediate layer. And then we'll uh, train some function. In this case, it'll just be a kind of uh, linear function. So we'll take uh, a linear map and then apply sigmoid to get something between zero and one. Uh, that's going to give us probabilities. So it's parameterized by some vector theta. And then we're going to optimize theta such that uh, first of all, the first thing I said is true, that P plus and P minus add up to one or approximately add up to one. I need to do one other thing because there's a trivial solution, which is to say everything is equally likely to be true or false and assign 50-50 to everything. And I don't want that. So I'll also add something that kind of like pushes, like add a penalty term that kind of pushes things apart. Um, so uh, for the exact functions, you can uh, can read this paper. But if we do this, uh, what happens? So first of all, you know, I guess by default, nothing reasonable had to happen here because um, you're just kind of like, you have no labels. You're just finding this like random direction that satisfies this consistency property. But uh, somewhat amazingly, if I decode this by, for instance, saying that the likelihood of something being true is 
you know, or sorry, the likelihood of the answer to a question being yes is, uh, you know, P plus plus one minus P minus over two, um, then you actually get very good separation between uh, things where the right answer is yes and the right answer is no. So basically, um, you know, all of these blue are, are yes answers and all of these uh, orange are no answers and you actually get uh, very good clustering. So this is the first thing is that somehow this consistency condition, even though you weren't looking at, like you didn't have access to the logits, right? So you didn't actually know whether the model actually would output yes or no on these, you only had the latent states, but you're still actually able to uh, recover something reasonable. So that's the first thing is you can actually find the correct answers without access to the logits. Um, perhaps more interestingly, you do better than the model itself. So it's not just that this gets you reasonable answers, it gets you more accurate answers than if you just ask the model the question. So specifically, um, you can take kind of, you know, some diverse uh, set of natural language processing data sets. Uh, they, they all have to be binary because this is uh, relying on binary answers. So, you know, these are things like sentiment classification, topic identification, uh, question answering. Uh, for each of these, you know, take several different prompts to try to get the model to answer, uh, answer the question. So this is in a zero shot setting. So if you consider, uh, you know, different variations of, uh, of zero shot evaluation, uh, this method, which is called CCS, on average actually does significantly better uh, than zero shot. And uh, not only that, but it's actually less sensitive to the particular prompt. Right, so we saw this issue before that uh, sometimes models kind of do weird things in response to prompts where they just kind of, you know, like copy a list or something like that. Um, so uh, this kind of decreased prompt sensitivity indicates uh, that this method is, uh, is perhaps less prone to doing that. So you might be worried, okay, maybe this is just doing well because I had a bunch of unlabeled data that I used to fine tune this model and we know that data helps. But actually with uh, only say four to 16 unlabeled samples, you actually already get, uh, get pretty good accuracy from this method. And also it transfers across tasks. So I can kind of you know, find this truth-like direction on sentiment analysis, and it will do well at topic classification or question answering, even though the type of question you're asking is actually entirely different. Um, so the overall point here is that it seems like we found this kind of latent state that actually contains more knowledge than the model itself is outputting. And so what that suggests is that uh, the model does indeed, you know, have these latent features that are, uh, are giving us more than, than what the model actually wants to tell us if it's just trained to produce likelihood. So um, beyond this, there's a few other ways in which latent states have been used to try to improve models. Uh, another approach is what I'll call alignment via ablation. So the idea here is to kind of find sort of, you know, uh, like bad components in models or components of models that are leading to bad behavior and just get rid of them. So one very crude way you can do this is you can actually just remove late stages of the model's computation, just kind of like chop off the last few layers. Um, that obviously is very crude, but if you think that what's happening is you know, for most of the computation, the model is just sort of figuring out what's true. And then at some point it's like adapting truth to likelihood by adding in all the biases, then maybe you think this will help. Uh, uh, perhaps more targeted thing you could do is try to actually understand different components of the model and identify specific ones that have problems and remove those. And so both of these have been tried. So um, one thing, is you can actually do this kind of chopping off the last few layers by doing something called early exiting, uh, at least for models that uh, have something called a residual stream. So if you do early exiting from a residual stream, it mitigates a uh, phenomenon called false context following, where if I have examples in the context that are wrong, uh, the model will tend to have uh, less accurate answers to a new question. Um, and you can, uh, you know, you can also do something more targeted where instead of just you know, chopping off the end of the network, you can actually identify specific attention heads uh, that seem to be kind of attending to previous things in the context and, uh, and copying the wrong answers. And if you remove those, uh, then this also reduces bad behavior. Uh, this has actually been used beyond language models as well. So um, there's some really cool work by Hernandez et al that actually 
trains text models to describe what image neurons and image networks are doing to find out which ones are doing things you don't want and then delete those neurons. And this can reduce uh, spurious cues. So the kind of overall point here is that, uh, you know, by studying the process of the models undertaking and not just uh, its sort of uh, final outcome, this lets you identify and potentially fix problems. Um, how am I doing on time, Nicola? It's like five minutes or 10 minutes left? OK, five minutes technically. OK, great. Um, so I guess the final thing I'll say here is that uh, latencies have also been used in, in other ways that are uh, somewhat related to intent alignment. So we kind of uh, identified emergence as one of the challenges to alignment. And uh, people have actually been able to, by studying the evolution of latent states during training, uh, better understand and explain the causes of emergent behavior. Um, there's also kind of this like on, ongoing effort to uh, come up with a sort of bottom up understanding of what neural networks are doing by uh, kind of identifying the, the sort of computational circuits that make up the output. And in some cases, it can be used to identify out of distribution failures in models. So to summarize this latent knowledge approach, the, the main advantage here is that we are kind of avoiding the arms race against our own models because instead of uh, training them to you know, produce some approved output, which could lead to reward hacking, we're just kind of understanding what they're doing and trying to find the parts of what they're doing that correspond to what we want and kind of like grabbing those and pulling them out. Um, and in particular, this is something that you know, arguably should get easier as models get better because of the better representations, it should be kind of easier to find these directions. Um, the kind of clear disadvantages are that it's not really scalable yet. Um, uh, the CCS method uh, with kind of uh, negation consistency, for instance, is limited to binary classification and, and other methods discussed here are fairly, uh, you know, bespoke and require kind of hand examination of the network. And we also don't really have time tested methodological norms for understanding the internals of models, you know, with the outputs, we can just see what's more and less accurate. With the internals, we're kind of interpreting these vectors and, you know, it's less clear what's going on. Okay. So in the last few minutes, I want to kind of step back and look at other approaches to alignment beyond um, these two approaches that uh, have been used for language models. So, uh, you know, there's like many important alignment problems uh, beyond language. We've kind of, you know, seen examples like recommender systems, uh, human robot interaction, uh, code generation. And so uh, for these problems, there's kind of a diverse set of tools that are starting to emerge. So one thing is instead of you know, taking human annotations, you could try to infer rewards and intent. You could also try to imbue models with common sense morality. And there's also kind of economic perspectives for thinking about uh, feedback loops and other phenomena like that. So uh, to kind of go over each of these briefly, with inferring rewards and intent, the kind of idea is that uh, you know, even without annotations, if I can just observe human actions, this provides a potentially rich source of implicitly labeled data, right? If I watch a human demonstrate how to do something, that could help me infer the reward function they have in their head for the task they're trying to accomplish. And then I could try to copy that reward function over to be what I do. And so this is letting me try to kind of give you what you want without you having to tell me what you want. I'm kind of inferring it. Um, you could also get this from interactions. You know, if you have a human and a robot, and the robot tries to do something and the human tries to correct them. That's kind of evidence that the human didn't want the robot to do that thing. And so that gives you um, a source of feedback. And the other thing is just the state of the world. If we imagine that people kind of, you know, put the world into states that they like, then the state of the world should also give you uh, rich sources of information about human reward. Um, so to, for a kind of unified uh, uh, framework on this, uh, there's a nice paper called Reward Rational Choice uh, by Gian et al. Uh, there is also issues with this, though, which is that to do all of this, you need kind of a model of the of humans, right? You need a model of how their uh, how their goals map to their actions, because I guess you could assume that people are perfectly rational, but this is usually a bad assumption. And in general, uh, the kind of things you get out of this in the worst case can be highly sensitive to the human models you have. Uh, so another approach is common sense morality. This is kind of trying to get at the idea that, okay, many of the things we care about are implicit, right? Uh, 
these things like don't do harm, uh, don't break the law. Uh, and, you know, where do we get kind of all these implicit constraints? We get them from common sense. And so maybe if we could uh, get models to kind of also have common sense moral understanding, this would help. So there's both uh, data sets that kind of try to test common sense moral understanding and also provide a, a kind of training data set. Uh, there's also RL environments where you kind of have a game plan agent that has an explicit reward. And then there's a bunch of kind of uh, non, not explicitly stated, you know, moral constraints that the system should, uh, you know, we want it to satisfy, but is not part of its reward function. And so actually, you know, taking the morality models learned from these data sets and using them as a kind of uh, reward shaping on these environments can actually reduce immoral behavior. Um, and then finally, there's uh, kind of economic perspectives on this feedback loop problem that I mentioned at the beginning, where one way we can think about feedback loops is that users respond to system incentives, right? For instance, um, if I have an ML algorithm that's uh, deciding whether to extend a line of credit to someone, they're probably going to kind of do things to optimize their credit score. And so you get this kind of strategic behavior. And so the strategic behavior can bias both the observed user distribution and also uh, the user's interactions with the system, right? So users that don't like the system might drop out of it. And so this can create uh, kind of feedback loops, or they might strategically interact with the system to get the responses they want. And so the tools to kind of handle this are uh, our causal inference, trying to get better models of user behavior, but this is kind of a, a fairly wide open problem. Um, I guess the, another point is that uh, better predictions can actually lead to worse social outcomes. Uh, so there's work by Kleinberg and Raghavan that discusses this. Um, but since I'm kind of short on time, maybe I will uh, just sort of skip to uh, summary. So uh, we've seen in this tutorial that alignment is hard. Uh, due to you know these three issues, the reward hacking arms race, emergent capabilities, and feedback loops. Uh, human feedback reduces some of these issues, but certainly doesn't solve all of them. Uh, kind of extracting latent knowledge reduces a different set of issues, but is not necessarily scalable. And there's many other approaches to alignment. This is kind of a wide and growing field. Uh, so I'll end by just uh, leaving some open problems on this slide, and uh, just thank you all for listening and you can uh, find the slides on our website, thanks.